Here being part of our Wednesday night service, we're glad that everyone is here. Uh, we have several announcements before we get into our uh, devotional time together. Uh, we've got several that we need to remember as being sick. Randy Moore had surgery today and he's uh, uh, doing well. Uh, he's in Tupelo Hospital at this time. Wanda Hoffman's in the Magnolia Hospital. Sue and Craig Glenn continue in Nashville. Both of them are in rehab. Uh, Maggie Hester's in the Methodist Hospital in Memphis. Uh, Dorothy Stanford is Lisa's mother's in Magnolia Hospital, uh, and she continues there. Uh, we've been asked to remember the family of Joe Lindsay. Joe was one of the managers at our local Walmart that passed away. His funeral service is tomorrow at 2 o'clock at, Magno uh, at uh, Macmillan Funeral Home. We've also been asked to remember Christian Harris. Uh, he's been waiting on a heart transplant. He's in Le Bonner. This young man is, uh, there's a possibility that he'll have a, uh, a new heart today, uh, tonight. And uh, so we've been asked to have a special prayer for him and for those that are sick. If you'd bow with me. Father, we are so thankful for all of the advances in medicine and we, we're thankful that uh, that we have the opportunity to pray for Christian Harris uh, as he could possibly receive a new heart. And we pray that you will be with him during this procedure and pray that he'll come through it and be able to live a normal life. Father, we're mindful of the family of Joe Lindsay. We pray for Randy Moore, Wanda Hoffman, Craig and Sue Glenn, Maggie Hester and Dorothy Stanford that you'll be with each of these and touch their lives as only you can. These things we ask through Jesus' name. Amen. Food pantry item for this week is canned fruit. Uh, this coming Sunday, following our morning service, we'll be continuing to make uh, uh, pictures for our new church directory. We want every family uh, and individual to have a, new, have a picture in the new directory. Uh, if you'd like to, to have your picture made, please sign the, seat, sign the sheet and the foyer. Uh, and this will be the last of our planned uh, opportunities to have pictures made. Uh, if you still haven't had one made, you can submit one to, to Miss Jimmy. Our senior adult rally is this coming Saturday. Uh, Ted Burleson will be with us. This is from 9.30 until 1.30. Lunch will be served. Uh, all of those, all of our members that are 55 and older or anyone you know uh, that would like to come, we, we sure would like to have them. The ladies' Bible class will resume on Tuesday, September the 4th at 9.30 a.m. All of our ladies are invited to be part of the uh, Bible study at that time. That's September the 4th at 9.30. That's all of our announcements. Uh, Alex is coming to lead her singing. Good evening. If you'd like to go and mark the song book or your text song, we have a 911 and a 911. Green Christ, your broken life. And after you get that mark, if you would turn it over to page 611. Sing the first and third verse. <coughs> Walking in sunlight. Oh.
pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for letting us come here today and learn more about your word. Dear Lord, please be with all the sick and get them back to you as soon as possible. Dear Lord, please be with the military overseas and keep them safe. And most of all, thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for the remission of our sins. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Scripture reading will be from Acts 4, 23 through 25. Acts 4, 23 through 25. I'm reading from the ESV. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported with the chief priests and the elders said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voice together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit. Why did the Gentiles rage and why did the peoples plot in vain? I was scared there for a moment that Alex thought I was going to speak a long time, but he's back, so uh, we'll be fine. Good evening. I'm glad you're here this, this evening and uh, humbled to be standing before you. Um, I'm it's one thing before I get into the scripture that was just read uh, real fast. I, I feel like I need to thank you all for all the support for a Northeast Night since I'm standing in front of you. I'll tell you a quick story. Um, one of the coaches who, who'd been coming the last few years, I'd seen him the last few years, he was filling a plate for his family who wasn't able to make it. So they had, he had a couple plates. And I said, look, get a lot more than that. There's a lot left. And he said, I don't know how y'all do this. And I, I thought... You know, for you, you may not understand. And that's just what the Lord's church does, isn't it? We provide and we support and we make things happen for good. And uh, I thought that was a really good compliment for you guys. And I wanted to share that with you. And just want to make sure you know how much I appreciate you. Uh, the scripture tonight that I asked Drew to read, this, we've been studying in the book of Acts on Sunday morning. Drew's been helping me lead that class uh, off and on. And uh, we covered Acts chapter 4 uh, a couple weeks ago, and we studied specifically uh, these verses that he started reading uh, this past Sunday. So real quick, in chapter 3, Peter and John heal a lame man. Uh, of course, it stirs up the crowd. Peter takes advantage of it, preaches a lesson because of that. He had the crowd there, so he taught them the gospel. Um, a lot of good things was happening, but then in chapter 4, you find out that the Sanhedrin, the council, the chief priests, they didn't appreciate all of this being talked about or Christ being talked about and all this excitement about Christ. So they came and they put Peter and John into prison. So they threw them into prison for no reason, kept them overnight. Next day, they put them um, in front of the council or in front of the court, and uh, they end up releasing them, as you just read in verse 23, because mainly because they didn't have any reason to keep them. But they threatened them before they released them. And then we read immediately what they did after they were released from this event. I'm not going to reread what Drew read for us. But what I want to say is this. What you find in verses 23 through 25 reminds me of why we're here tonight. It says when they were released in verse 23, they went to their friends. In verse 24, their friends and Peter and John praised God, turned to him. And then verse 25, it says they use scripture to gain comfort and encouragement. Is that not why we're here tonight? We rush home from work and we get our kids ready to go. And some of us get here just in enough time to gather with friends to turn to God and to get strength from the scriptures. For all of our teachers, I thank you tonight for doing that. For everybody sitting in the pews, I want you to know how much I appreciate that I can call you friends and that I get encouragement from you. But we're also here tonight and we, we take this opportunity to offer the invitation. We do it every time on Wednesday night because we never know the situation of an individual sitting out in the pews. And if you need to put Christ on in baptism, we ask you to, we, we encourage you to do that tonight. Become a Christian. If you're a Christian, you just need to repent of your sins. Or if you need to turn to Christ because you've been living wrong, of course, we encourage you to do that. Or maybe you just need prayers. 
If there's any way we can assist you, come now while we stand and while we sing.
request tonight? Okay. How's she doing? Okay. She has a terrible bed sore. Very distinct, and she can't let her hands are back. She can't move anything. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so thankful for all that you've given us, all that you've blessed us with. We are thankful for the ability to come uh, before you and lay up our petitions and our prayers and our concerns, Heavenly Father. Lord, we are thankful of those, for those that have been mentioned tonight, and we pray that you will be with each one of them in their, in their own way. Some have lost a loved one. Some are struggling with long-term health ailments, and are, we need you to be with those people in every way that you can, Heavenly Father. Comfort the families of those that lost loved ones. Guide us as we go through our study tonight, Heavenly Father, and pray that we will learn much uh, from your word and that we will apply those things to our lives. And we pray that we will always uh, learn from the examples that you've given us in your text, Lord. And of course, in all these things, we pray in your great and holy Son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so we will be in Genesis 42, uh, verse 42. We're going to start in 37. I know we got past that. We're going to start in 37. So Genesis 41, verse 37. So 41, verse 37. So as you recall last week, we talked about that there was a dream, that Pharaoh had a dream, and that uh, Joseph was called to interpret that dream. And he came in, and what was the first thing he did when he went to interpret that dream? Gave glory to God. After that, we hear the dream was, or he, the, dream, the dream was told uh, to Joseph, and it was a very simple dream from the standpoint of you had fat cows eaten by skinny cows, and skinny cows didn't change, and you had large ears of grain eaten by small ears of grain, and you couldn't tell they had gone away. And after this happened, Joseph said, what that means is, is that there's going to be seven years of plenty in the land, and there's going to be seven years of famine in the land, and Pharaoh, you need to appoint someone to oversee the land of Egypt during this time. And Pharaoh looks around, and he says, you know, who do we have that can do this? And so we work by that's verse 38, and then verse 39, uh, Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has shown you in all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. So Joseph was promoted significantly. And I, I want you to think about the, the rise and the pace with which you know, he rose. He is in a jail cell, not even shaven. He is plucked from that jail cell, shaven, washed up, new clothes on, interprets a dream. whole conversation takes about 10 minutes, maybe, right? And next thing you know, we're going to get to where we're at tonight, verse 40. It says, you shall be over my house, 
and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne, I will be greater than you. Did Pharaoh leave anything out besides giving up his... I mean, he didn't give up his throne, right? He kept that. But did he leave anything else out? No. And what was his... What was Pharaoh's reason? We hit this at the very end of class. What was Pharaoh's reason for having that much confidence in a guy that was in jail, basically rotting, just literally an hour earlier? Nobody else like him. You know, it, it's funny how if you try to get certain jobs in life, you hear, well, you, have, you don't have this experience, or you don't have that experience, right? There's this belief that you just instantly climb to the top. That's the way it works. It's not the way the real world works. Not nothing I've ever seen works that way. But at any rate, the, the funny thing about those type of conversations that we deal with in earth is you always hear this thing about, well, you need this experience. Well, how do you get that experience if no one ever gives you the chance to get it? Right? And so everybody, everyone can relate to that. How much experience did Joseph have running a country before this happened? Zero. I think we oftentimes tell this story about Joseph, but Joseph wasn't the only one that had faith in God in this situation. Right? Pharaoh, who was not exactly a God-fearing man, by the way we define that, had an enormous amount of faith. But here's the crazy thing. How did Pharaoh know Joseph was right? He's the only one that can interpret it, but my point is, he's the only one that came up with a reason. How does Pharaoh actually know he's right? Has to be faith, has to be divine intervention almost, God convincing Pharaoh to do this in his own mind. But something is there, and we can't miss that part of the story. That that is an enormous amount of faith, an enormous leap, and basically he made up this rule about why well, he didn't make it up. We know that, but from Pharaoh's perspective, this guy walks in, tells him the interpretation, takes no credit for it, says God's the one that's doing it. And he's like, "Well, if that God is doing that, and He knows and He's taking care of you, you need to be the one that takes care of this." And so we see this faith of Pharaoh, which is unique. And the fact that you don't see that in today's world. I'm doing my big arms again. I saw that. There it goes again. There it is. All right? <laughs> Anyways. So as you're looking through those things and you see that, this faith of Pharaoh, he says, it's yours. And he says, verse 41, and Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over all the land. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him ride in his second chariot and they called out before him, bow the knee. Thus he set him over all the land of Egypt. Once again, you're in a jail cell a handful of hours earlier. Now you have the king's ring on, which gives you basically signature authority. You're giving gold chains, fine linen clothes. You're putting the chariot directly behind Pharaoh, and there's a people walking around your chariot saying, bow the knee. What was he being treated like in the land of Egypt? A king, right? Pharaoh immediately basically has a parade to introduce this new guy, right? This new man. So whenever we change football coaches, because it's about that time of the season, right? You have the Rebel Road Show or whatever that other school does. And they go around and they introduce this thing, right? And then that green egg, not green egg, that's what I cook on. That golden egg goes with them if they want it, right? And then we get our pictures taken with it. We're super happy because we've got it for at least one year. Right? And there's a parade because this is the new guy that's going to take the helm. And then three or four years, we're like, he's terrible. Here's the next new guy. Right? And this is a cycle we keep seeing. This happened at times in these times as well where kings would introduce new rulers or new people that were in charge. But this is unique in the fact that you typically saw these people coming. No one would have forecasted or 
gotten this, this idea that Joseph was going to be number one besides Pharaoh in the kingdom. But he is. He's given all this authority. There's a parade that happens. What is Joseph's job? Governor of all of Egypt, that is, that is it. And it's, the reason I ask that question is when I do performance reviews with my employees, we have that conversation. What, what is your job? And you would be amazed how many people have never thought about what their job is. And you're going to be like, well, they do it. That's not the same thing. Right? What was, his, what was the reason that he was selected to be the governor of Egypt? Not to interpret dreams, phenomenal guess. Take that one step further now. He interpreted a dream, and what did that dream tell him to do? To put up food. So what is his job going to be? And it's not, I don't want the answer of put up food. I want to make sure we understand the logistical nightmare that he just inherited. What is his job? Ultimately, he's a tax collector. You're going to take the biggest harvest the farmers of Egypt have ever seen in their life, and you're going to collect 20% of it or one-fifth of it, take it away from them, and store it somewhere in a safe and effective manner. What is grain back then? It's money. Think about it. It's a currency. So keep that in mind as we go through this. So his job, logistically speaking, is to collect, transport, and store seven years' worth of grain, 20% of the largest turnover or harvest these guys have ever seen. That is a massive undertaking. And do not miss that. This isn't managing the farmers in Prentice County. And if you ever want to see a, f a farm on like major scale, just drive through Iowa. You have no idea how many ears of corn this country use, uses until you drive through Iowa. You're like, where does it all go? Right? But my point is, this is a country. So this is a massive undertaking and think about the silos you used to see, right? A lot of them are falling down now. The tops are falling in and trees are running out the top of them. But anyways, think about those silos. This is one silo and one farm in Prentice County. Think about the size of those things. And that's basically a grain yield for maybe a year or maybe if they store their food in it for the cattle or whatever. This is going to be enough food to take care of a country for seven years. I don't think we ever really take into account the size of this job. Let me put it to you like this. I was reading, or listening to, I always say reading, but I was listening to a book today, and it was talking about the very end of the Civil War. The very end. And he was talking about how many rations an army was supposed to get. Now this is just 60,000 people. 60,000 people. Each division was allotted 300 pounds of bacon. Each division. That'd be about 60 divisions. That's a day's rations. Okay. If you did the math, that's just the, now we didn't store, that's not what we stored here, we stored grain. But let's put that into perspective. That's just 60,000 people, not however many thousands, hundreds of thousands that lived in Egypt. Not to mention their cows had to be fed, their livestock had to be fed. And oh wait, we know the end of the story, right? There's got to be enough food for a place bigger than the land of Egypt. The construction the planning that it would take to prepare up this much food was an enormous job. 
and all we get is that Joseph was put over the land of Egypt. And we just read that and say, oh, that big of a deal. Well, this is a big deal. And so he goes through this, and what's interesting is, is he's needing to get to work fairly soon, but then we get where Pharaoh starts blessing him some more. Verse 44 says, Moreover, moreover Pharaoh said to, said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no one shall lift up a hand or foot in the land of Egypt. No one can take a step without your permission. The reason I think Pharaoh goes to that point right there is, I think Pharaoh gets it, that this is a big job he's about to give him. And he's got to have full authority. Now, we're the land of the free, right? And we love our freedoms. And Egypt didn't have that type of freedom back then, but it wasn't exactly completely oppressive all the time. This is fixing to be oppressive. What's about to happen? Verse 45 says, And Pharaoh called Joseph's name zaphnath paneah so basically he is officially an Egyptian now. Is he an Egyptian by race or anything else? No, he's Hebrew, but he has a legitimate Egyptian name now. So he has been made a permanent member. He is no longer in the slave prisoner world. He is now officially an Egyptian citizen. It says, and he gave him in marriage Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. Now let's think through this. You've got a man believing in God. What better wife than to pick than someone a priest's daughter? Now, of course, this priest would not have believed in the same God in the same ways that Joseph did, but at least you've got to give Pharaoh credit for trying. Right? This is a person of high position in Egypt. He gives her to Joseph. I assume the priest is okay with this? Because it doesn't say the priest offered. It said Pharaoh gave him. Right? I think sometimes we don't appreciate our freedoms. But anyway, it says he, Pharaoh gave him this woman, the daughter of Potiphar, and so Joseph went out over the land of Egypt. That is such a subtle statement for what's about to happen. Joseph went out over the land of Egypt. Sounds like he's just going on a Sunday walk. Right? It's not what's happening. This is a construction issue. This is a logistics of moving the grain. This is a massive undertaking. And so Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of, king of the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt. During the seven plentiful years, the earth produced abundantly, just as it said it would happen. And he gathered up all the food of these seven years, which we know was 20% or one-fifth, which occurred in the land of Egypt, and put the food in the cities. I think that's a point that I appreciate now more than I used to as I'm learning how these things actually work. It would have been very tempting for Joseph to put all the food in one spot. Right? Easier to control from an accounting perspective. I can control this area. I don't have multiple warehouses I have to inventory. But from a delivery standpoint, that's an awful idea. So he has, he has actually constructed the first distribution center in probably the modern world, not modern world, this modern part of the world, in this part of the age of the world. He has created a distribution network within his cities, which means he has multiple supervisors, multiple controllers taking care of this for him. He is supervising this whole operation. But this is where it really starts to get into, into effect. He says, verse 49, And Joseph stored up grain in great abundance. When the Bible typically says words like, abundance, what does that imply? A whole lot. Right? And where I'm going with that is, is, God doesn't use words like that very much. But when He does, you really see wealth. Like when God says He was a wealthy man, it's excessively wealthy. When God says this happened abundantly, it's excessively abundantly. Like the sand of the sea. This um, reminds me of a walk Kim and I did many, many years ago on a little island called Dolphin Island in Alabama where we decided we were going to walk to the tip of the island. 
We found out about six and a half miles later that tip was about seven and a half miles one way. But it just seemed like a really good idea at the time. No water, not a good idea. That is a lot of sand. And what's wild is, is I, I've taken my boat out 20 miles, and it is, you know, 80 feet deep. And you drop an anchor, and you know what's on your anchor when you pull it up? Depending on where you're at, sand. So I'll look at this from the standpoint of when God is using an exaggeration like the sand of the sea, this grain, I want in your mind to get your favorite beach, whether it's Destin or wherever, get your favorite beach and look at that long shoreline. Every way you can go. And then make it in vertical columns all over the land of Egypt. It's a lot of grain. It's a lot of food. Until, I like this part, he ceased to measure it. I wonder at what point Joseph has been keeping up like, okay, so I've got... There's two million people at seven pounds of grain a day. I need this many pounds of grain to get through the seven years. Right? And I'm piling it up at this rate, because this is what accountants do, just so you know. He's figuring it up, and he's, he's met his goal, and he's like, well, maybe I need 20% extra. Maybe I need 30% extra. Maybe that's 100%. And he's just one day, he just goes, that's it. I'm done. Just keep piling it over there. So he says he literally couldn't even measure it anymore. Like he just gave up. Like, that's it, I'm done. We're going to keep stacking it over there, but I'm done with it. Until it could not be measured. Now we mentioned earlier, what was grain? Back in this time. Corn, grain, but I mean, what was it in a literal sense? It was currency or money. What has Egypt suddenly become? excessively rich, right? The land of Egypt is now excessively rich. I propose to you that all those things you see about the kingdom of Egypt coming in the second kingdom were financed from this event. And I'll show you why later on. I don't have a thing I can point to. I don't have anything. I don't have any historical data other than one tomb in the middle of where all the slaves were buried. That was a tomb of a king, and he was Hebrew, and his tomb's empty. That's all I have to say that he was there. But it's there. Okay? It's very important to remember that. We'll get to that when we get to the end of Genesis, when he dies. But the point of the matter is, you don't build pyramids unless you have a lot of money to waste on your dead kings. Where did it come from? Well, let's keep reading. Verse 50, Before the year of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph. Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bore them to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my hardship and all my father's house. Okay? The name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. So, he is made, he's now, he went from being sad about missing his homeland to I have now forgotten that. I'm now looking ahead. I'm looking forward. There's at least two or three Bible passages we could point to about that. I'm looking forward. I've forgotten what's behind me. And no reason living in the past. Life's looking pretty good right now. Got grain coming out my ears. Right? And then he says, looking forward, when Ephraim comes along, he says, God has made me fruitful in my land of abundance. What a change of heart, right? Slave... So now he names his son after the land. So now we go on. Verse 53 says, The seven years of plenty that occurred in the land of Egypt came to an end, and the seven years of famine began to come. As Joseph had said, there was famine in all the lands, but in all the land of Egypt, there was bread. Notice this little hint of Scripture. Pharaoh's dream was about seven years of famine, and seven, or seven years of plenty and seven years of famine specifically relating to the land of Egypt. But according to the Bible, where all was the famine? Everywhere. Everywhere. That's right. So, well, how does that work? When all the land of Egypt was famished, 
The people cried to Pharaoh for bread. For bread. For the Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, Go to Joseph, what he says to you, do. Now, you have hated Joseph for seven years because he's taken all of your crops and piled them up. Then the famine hits, and you go crying to Pharaoh, We don't have any food. And Pharaoh goes, Go to Joseph, the guy that took all that stuff from you, and he's going to take care of you. There's at least one or two references to an eldership I could make right here. Because oftentimes we don't appreciate our leaders and those making the decisions, and we think that we have all the cards, we understand every decision they make, and that is rarely the case. I guarantee you Joseph was not a popular man and was not appreciated in the land of Egypt until this day. Can you imagine having those kind of crops and this guy taking it away from you? Could you imagine what that felt like? And there might have even been grumblings. He was a Hebrew in jail. I've been an Egyptian my whole life. And then one day when you're starving and your kids don't have any bread, you get told, you need to go talk to him. He's going to take care of this for you. So it changes the mindset of the people. And so verse 56, it says, So when the famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. That is classic government at work, is it not? Take it, and we'll sell it back to you. Congratulations. Right? But let's remember something about this when we get there. For the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all the earth, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain. Everyone that could get to Egypt had heard Egypt has food. And they all got sent to a little Hebrew man named Joseph. And he had all the bread in the world. If they sold it to the Egyptians, do you think the price they sold to everybody else was higher or lower? Guaranteed. Pharaoh and Egypt became a very rich land during this time. Because see, this is what we call, in economics, supply and demand, right? As the supply goes down in a famine and the demand goes up, what happens to prices? You could imagine by year seven, the trains of wagons of gold coming into the land of Egypt. Just think about that, right? And you're an Egyptian paying some, and all of a sudden there is... Instead of piles of grain, there's piles of everything else. Everything valuable on the earth goes in the land of Egypt for seven years. It's a long time. Verse or Chapter 42, it gets really bad for some people that are really good friends with Joseph, right? It says, when Jacob, when Joseph, when Jacob, good night, I can read that right in a minute. When Jacob learned that there was grain for the sale in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you look at one another? And he said, Behold, I have heard that there is grain for sale in Egypt. Go down and buy grain for us there, that we may live and not die. It almost sounds like Jacob has told his boys, Hey, we need to get supper ready, or we need to get prepared. And they're all just looking at each other. And what do all of them not want to tell their dad? We don't have anything, dad. There's nothing to cook. And he says, I've heard there's bread in Egypt, grain in Egypt. Go there and get some. Now, was Jacob a rich man? We've talked about that, right? Very wealthy man. And so there was money sent. He's almost like a small country unto himself by this time, probably. He sends money and his boys ironically enough, to their brother, to buy bread. And this part of the scene is where it really, you, you almost feel good for Jacob, and you can, or Joseph rather, and you're just like, you know, this is, this is the ultimate payback of paybacks, right? So there's an attitude that Joseph could have here. And we'll go through how he responded to this. And I think the human side of Joseph came out here. I really do. And I'll talk about why I think that. But here we go. 
In verse 4, it says, But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, when his brothers, for fear that, might, that harm might happen to him, thus the sons of Israel came to buy among the others who came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. Does that sound familiar? He's still protecting that, his favorite child, right? All you worthless boys, you go get us some grain, but Ben's going to stay here. Right? I've already lost one. He was with y'all. I went to go check on y'all, and he got eaten. And it almost makes you wonder if Jacob kind of has inklings in the back of his mind that the story he got wasn't quite true. That he didn't trust this son to go with those brothers. And so, verse 5, Thus the sons of Israel came to buy among the others who came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. So it has spread out of Egypt, it's in the land of Canaan, and they need food. Now, no one knows this except for Joseph. Joseph was the governor over the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. There was a dream about this. Right? Yeah. And he interpreted his dream in a little way. He's like, all your stuff came and all your stalks bowed down to mine. And here it's happening. And Joseph recognized them. Can you imagine the emotion of what that would have felt like? You are quite literally, essentially, the king of Egypt. And these boys that threw you in a pit and sold you to slavery have just walked up and they just put their faces on the dirt in front of you. But here's the best part of the story. You're dressed in fine ribbon and fine linen. You speak Egyptian. And they have no idea who you are. Now, brothers mess with brothers, right? Even when they're 30. At this point, he'd be 44, right? So, they're still messing with each other, so he decides to have a little fun with them. And you could say it was almost mean, but they probably kind of had it coming, for being fair. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he treated them like strangers and spoke roughly to them. Where'd you come from, he said. They said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. And Joseph remembered the dreams that he had dreamed of them. And he said to them, You are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. Now, why would he accuse them of that? Do what? Yeah, he's getting back at them, but it's it's a very good con. And what I mean by that is, if the land, if there's famine everywhere, that means every country's getting weak. The will to fight is out of them. That's actually what the book I was reading about today was. Was the will to fight. They always thought it was out. It was over with. War's over. And it never was. And they're like, how are they still fighting? But the point of the matter is, you can't keep an army running if there's no food. So he makes this accusation that they're spies. Because remember, they're not Egyptians. They're Hebrews. And he accuses them of being spies. And you can imagine their face, right? We're not spies. That's not us. No, 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 no. Because what does that actually in, what, interpret that real quick? If you're found guilty of being a spy, what's going to happen to you? Dead. Right? Dead. So that's like the worst thing they could be charged with. So then they have to respond, right? Uh, verse, verse 10, they said to him, No, my Lord, your servants have come to buy food. We're all sons of one man. We are honest men. Oh, the irony of that. Now, they're being honest right now. But you not, Joseph's acting here is astounding. If you really think about it. Because at that part of the story, I'd have been like, Oh, really? What'd you tell dear old daddy? You know? We're honest men. Your servants have never been spies. Okay, that's true. Verse 12, he said to them, No, it is the nakedness of the land that you have come to see. And they said, We, your servants, are twelve brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan, and behold, 
The youngest is this day with our father, and one is no more. If you're Joseph, and your mom's son, your brother, is missing, what just went through your head? What? Flashback. Now you've gone and sold Ben. Don't sell Benjamin. You're going, they're going to have to find him before I do anything else. Do you blame him at all? That's a part of the story we, we just kind of breeze over. But you guarantee he had that same flashback. Because he knows that he was number one, which means Benjamin's number two, and now these same guys have run off from Daddy, and he ain't here. So he concocts this thing where he says, But Joseph said to them, it is, it is as I said to you, you are spies. By this you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not go from this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Unless you get that youngest brother and bring him back, and I can confirm your story is true, you're not getting out of here. Hmm. Verse 16, Send one of you and let him bring your brother while you remain confined, that your words may be tested whether there is truth in you. Or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. And he put them all together in custody for three days. What did he do to them? He locked them up. He threw them in a pit. Took him three days to get over it. It'd be hard to not, for it not to be longer than that, right? There are brothers and there are friends and there are family that don't talk to each other over a lot less. He locked them up for three days. On the third day, Joseph said to them, Do this and you will live, for I fear God. And <laughs> you almost get the impression right here, he's not saying that for their benefit. You almost think, like, he probably wanted to leave them there for a little while. And it would be natural for him to be angry. But his response is very interesting. I think this is an inward response. I had it really bad for a long time. God has super blessed me. He's given me a chance now to do with these brothers whatever I fear. I've got them in jail. Might ought to have a little compassion on them. Because if you push God too long, I might be back in the pit too. Now they didn't get all that, but in his internal brain this had to be going on because he's got to keep God happy. He gets that part of the story, right? So he says, For I fear God, verse 19, If you are honest men, let one of your brothers remain confined where you are in custody, and let the rest go and carry grain for the famine of your households, and bring your youngest brother to me, so your words will be verified and you shall die. Excuse me, you shall not die. And they did so. Verse 21, And they said to one another, In truth, we are guilty concerning our brother. It was that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us, and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. They're having a conversation with each other, and they're like, this, this is it. We, this is a bought lesson. Right? We brought this on ourselves. And I almost picture Reuben here just about to explode for some reason. Right? I don't know why Reuben in my mind, actually I do know why I'm fixing to say this. The only Reuben I have ever known in my life was one of the biggest human beings I've ever seen in my life. He taught strength and conditioning at Ole Miss when we were there. He was a big man. Okay? Threw his back out, proving to the Ole Miss guys that he could still squat 700 pounds. He was like 45 years old at the time. He was huge. His name is Reuben, and for some reason, Reuben Mendoza is who I see here. And if Reuben speaks, everyone else stops speaking. I just to see the anger on him where they say this, and Reuben answered them, Did I not tell you not to sin against the boy? But you didn't listen. So now there comes a reckoning for his blood. They did not know that Joseph understood them, for there was an interpreter between them. I love that this story leaves it all the way to right there, that this whole conversation that you have just read was spoken in English, excuse me, Egyptian, wrong he, spoken in Egyptian, and then converted to Hebrew, 
which he understood, they responded, goes back through the Egyptian again. So he's hiding his voice from them. But I can almost see Joseph sitting there going, oh, this is good. This is good. Y'all have no clue I know what you're saying. This reminds me of a story of my sister. My sister is much more cunning than she looks. She's really good at playing, playing like she's dumb, but she's not. She's very smart. That's the key to being super smart. You convince everybody else you're dumb. She's very good at it. But anyways, there was this time that the group of Puerto Rican boys at the International Science and Engineering Fair got on the elevator and started talking about her and the, and um, what is his name? Tara. Her dad's a physician here in town. Can't think of her last name. Chase. Her and Tara Chase were on the elevator together. Okay? And these Puerto Ricans start talking about these two young Mississippi girls. Now, they know English and they know Spanish. And so Michelle looks at Tara, and without saying a thing, they start talking in pig Latin to each other and laughing at the boys. Now what's more amazing is that these two women who had basically known each other for a week have a full conversation in pig Latin. Impromptu. And it made those Puerto Rican boys so mad. This is exactly what Joseph did. He had the whole language the whole time. He had all the cards on his deck. And he's just sitting back and enjoying it. And you have to feel good for the guy, right? Because he's been, he's just been awful till now. But the fact that they had no clue, they had no clue that this, this arguments occurred between them. And then he turned away from them and wept. It all got to him, right? Hard not to. And he returned to them and spoke to them, and he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. So he grabs Simeon, he binds him, and Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain and replace every man's money in his sack to give them provisions for the journey. And this was done for them. Joseph did not take a dime from his dad. Not a dime. But once again, the con is still on. He didn't tell them he was putting the money back in their sacks. So next week we get to see the response as they get on the journey and discover that not only are they accused of being spies, now they're going to be accused of being thieves as well because they have money they're not supposed to have. Thank you so much. Hope you have a great week.